In this video, I'm going to talk about basic application of inference rules, of our new inference rules within derivations. The I should say, so, you know, you're going to need to do derivations where you're going to have to show a, a disjunction, and derivations where you will have to show a conjunction, and derivations where you will have to show a biconditional. For the derivations that you will have to do for um, this first assignment, however, in the conclusions won't be any of those. Uh, no, there may be a conjunction, but showing conjunctions is it, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. You just get both of the conjuncts and then uh, uh, apply a, a junction. So we'll we'll need to talk, however, about more broadly show how we would go about establishing each of these show lines for the reason that I talked about in the last slide video that. There's no derivation method associated with any of those as there is um, with conditionals. So, okay, that said, let's take a look at this derivation. So we have, uh, we're not going to need to do an indirect derivation. We could. Uh, actually, let's see why we might not want to. So we would say show or why it's not going to be very helpful, I guess. We, uh, If we we're going to make an assumption, it would be an indirect assumption. And then we look to see, can we use not s? And we might notice that pr premise 3 is a conditional whose consequent is s. And so we could do 2, 3 modus tollens. And that's fine, except that the problem is we don't really know how to use 4 right now. Um, it's a negation of a disjunction, and we don't have any rules that apply to negated disjunctions. We have rules that apply to disjunctions and let you infer disjunctions, but no rules that apply to them. So we could say show a neg of 4, as we might have done in chapter 1 with the negated conditional. The problem then is the natural thing to do is to say assume id, and that's just not t or r again, and we haven't gotten anywhere. We're not in any better position to complete this subderivation than we are to complete the main derivation. And so this, we'll need to talk about how what you would do if you have a, a show line that's a disjunction. So for now, however, we're not going to take this strategy. So we're not going to... We don't want to work with this negated disjunction, and that means we don't need to make this indirect assumption. Instead, we're just going to do this directly. So let's bring in our premises. Okay. So we can, if we look at 2, 3, and 4, we see, okay, well, 2 is a conjunction, and we can apply simplification to 2. 3 is a uh, disjunction, so the rule that applies there is uh, MTP, and 4 is a conditional, and so it's modus ponens or modus tollens. Now we saw that modus ponens with or modus tollens with four is not with the this with this with the third premise is not very helpful because it gives us the negation of that. On the other hand, if we could just get T or R out flat out, then we could then apply modus ponens, get S, and we'd have a direct derivation. So what we want to think about doing is can we get to T or R? from lines 2 and 3. And if we can, then we'll be done. So the first thing we want to do in, in proceeding in that direction is to split up line 2. You don't necessarily always need to do both simplifications, but it can be helpful when you're getting started just to see what you have. So we have that P on line 5, and that P on line 5 looks pretty useless. Um, there's no P in anything else, so it's probably not going to be very helpful. Line 3 is a disjunction. Oh, well, we, sorry, let's look at line 6. We have not Q, and we want to consider can we use not Q with anything. We're not going to use it with 2, because we just split up 2. And we're not going to use it with 4, because it doesn't show up in 4. But if we look at 3, we see, okay, we have T or Q. And we ask, are there any rule applications we can make with 3, uh, with three or 6? Well, the rule, the elimination rule for uh, disjunctions is MTP. And the way MTP works is it says if you have the negation of one of the disjuncts, then you can infer the other disjunct. And we do have the negation of one of the disjuncts, because Q is one of the disjuncts, and we have its negation. So we can say 3, 6, MTP. And that gives us T. Now, by itself, T isn't going to help us get anywhere. Um, well, it, it doesn't get us to S by itself, I should say. Not in one step. Remember, we're thinking we want to get S from line 4, and the way we would get S from line 4 is modus ponens, and so we would need the antecedent of line 4. What's the antecedent of line 4? T or R. How do you infer, 
How do you get a disjunction? Well, one way is to use the introduction rules, to use the rule, the addition rule. And the addition rule says if you have either disjunct, if you have a, a, a if you have either disjunct of a disjunction, then you can infer the disjunction. Because addition says if you have something, then you can put it, and then whatever you want on either side of it, on the other side of the disjunction. And we have the left disjunct of t or r. We have t. So we can add r to t to get t or r. So we say 7 add. And we want to put the r on the right side of t. So we'll say add r. And the sentence we want to add is... Actually, let's do it without that first. Though. We'll see how this looks. So we want to add r to t. So we say t. Then we think, which one of these do we want? We want this one, because we want the t on the left. Here, the t is on the right. So we'll say, OK. What do we want to put in for z? What, do we, what we want to put in for z is r. So we'll say r, and we get t or r. Now, we could also have said 7 add on the right. And what do we want to add on the right? r. And, with, and so we can dodge going through those dialog boxes. Either way. Using the addition rule, we get T or R, and that's the antecedent of line 4, which gives us S. So, so far, the, the basic strategy is pretty much exactly the same as our initial chapter 1 strategy, except that when we get to stage 2, so remember there are three stages to that strategy. The first is set up the derivation using show conclusion, make an assumption, and then the show consequent to cycling if necessary, or if appropriate. The second stage is inference rule applications. And the third stage is subderivations. And at the second stage, in chapter one, we looked to do modus ponens and modus tollens. In other words, we looked to take conditionals and simplify them, apply elimination rules. And so we're basically just expanding that strategy. We're saying, let's apply elimination rules. And that's what we did uh, on line two. And then we're being a little bit clever and thinking, oh, well, look, instead of doing a subderivation of the antecedent of 4, we'll just directly infer it. So the inference rule application stage, in some sense, is just an extension of what we have done so far in Chapter 1. We just do more elimination rules. But we also, it's what the new part is we also want to think about are there introduction rule applications we can make that will help us move the derivation forward. And that's what we do at lines 8 or 9, that, because they're the same line, got in the same way. So that's 2C. All right, let's look at another problem. OK. So we'll say show conclusion. And we see that it's a conditional, so we'll assume the consequent. And we can go ahead and show the consequent and make an indirect assumption. In fact, lines 3 and 4 are going to turn out to be extraneous, but that's okay. So, but now we're done with the setting up of the derivation stage, so let's take a look at our premises. Okay, so premise 1 is a conjunction, and premise 2 is a conditional. So, and if we look at premise 2, we see, oh, there's if t then p in the consequent. Well, if we can get if t, then p, then we'd be done, because we could do modus tollens or modus tollens using lines 2 or 4, and we'd get a contradiction. We'd get either not t, or we'd get either p, which would contradict not p, or we'd get not t, which would contradict t. So if we could get the antecedent of line 6, we'd be good to go. Well, can we get the antecedent of line 6? What is it? It's q or r. If we look at line 5, we see, oh, line 5 is a conjunction. What are the conjuncts? The left conjunct is S. It's a conjunction because here's the main connective. So there's the left conjunct S, and there's the right conjunct Q or R. And that's, oh, that's the antecedent of line 6. So can we get Q or R from 5? Indeed, we can using our simplification rule. We simplify right to take the right conjunct, and that gives us Q or R. And that is the... Um, the antecedent of line, so we say 6 and 7 modus ponens, that gives us if t then p. So now we can apply line 2 with line 8, that's modus tollens, and we have t and not t. And now we have a contradiction, so that's 4, 9 indirect derivation. Not t is the consequent of line 1, that's a conditional derivation. So again, we just go through the setup stage to get to line 4, we bring in our premises, and then we sort of, before just automatically simplifying, we could have just simplified left and simplified right automatically without thinking about it. 
But what we did, in fact, and that would have been fine, and we would have gotten to the end, what we did, in fact, was we looked at line 6 and noticed, oh, the consequent of line 6 is useful because given what we with this not p and t, we can get a contradiction if we can out of it if we can get the consequent of line 6. So we thought, well, can we get if q then r? And we saw that we could because it's the right conjunct of line 5, and we can use simplification to get it. So that's 2d. And let's just take a look at 2e. Okay. Now here we're trying to show a conjunction. And if we make an indirect assumption, we just have the negation of the conjunction. And that's not really very useful. So we want to think, okay, fine. How do you get a conjunction? How do you get a conjunction, do you think? You use the rule of junction, which says if you have box and square, you can infer box and square. So what we want to do to get this is we want to get not Q, and we separately want to get T, and then we'll put them together, and we'll be done. Now let's see. Yeah. And uh, we'll be able to do that. It will, in some situations, we would choose to do a subderivation of either not Q or of T or of both of them. But in this case, we don't need to, as we'll see. So let's take a look at our two premises. So we have uh, kind of complicated stuff. The main connective of 3 is this biconditional, and the main connective of 4 is this conditional, or excuse me, conjunction. So we might want to just apply our elimination rules to both of these to help us see what we have. So with the biconditional, we can say 3 BCL for biconditional left, and we can also say 3 just BC, and we want to choose this one. We don't know which one of those was going to be useful yet, so we could, we could try to figure out which one is going to be useful, but let's not try and do that this time. Let's just say, okay, I don't know which one's going to be useful. I'll just write them both down. If you knew that one and only one was going to be useful, then fine. But if you don't, put them both down. You might even need both of them. Now let's look at four, and again, we'll simplify both sides without worrying about what they are. So now let's delete line two, in fact, because we're not going to use line two. It's not going to be helpful. It might be distracting. Let's get rid of it. Now, we've done all we can with line 2 because we got these two lines. We look at line 3. We've done all we can with line 3 because we've got these two lines. Right? All you can do with line 2 is the two bike and the BCs. And pretty much all you can do with line 3 are the two simplifications. So now we want to see, okay, is there anything we can do with 4, 5, 6, and 7, which we got from 2 and 3, to get not Q and also to get T? Well, the first thing is we can do modus ponens with 4 and 6. Right? 4 is a conditional whose antecedent is P, and 6 is P, so we can say 4, 6, modus ponens. So now we have not Q and S. Now we could go ahead and do, oh, look, I can do modus ponens with 5 and 8, but that just takes me back where I came from to P. So now that I've used 4, 5 is not helpful. I already have both sides of 5. I, we have P on line 6, and not Q and S on line 8. So 5, we can now ignore. But if we're thinking about boxing and canceling, which we should be, we should remember, aha, not Q is very useful, because not Q is one of the two conjuncts of the conjunction we're trying to show, so we can simplify it. So we're halfway, well, we're at least halfway done. We have half of what we want. If we can then get T, we're done. So, question is, can we get T? Well, we've used 4 and 5 and 6. We haven't used 7. And we've used 8, but we're not done with 8. Because we could also simplify left. Oops, no. Simplify right. Now, can we use S? Well, if we look at line 7, and that's the only remaining line we haven't really used, that's going to be of any use, we think, oh, yes. Uh, if we could do modus tollens with line 7, we would get not not T. And we want T, so we could double the neg negation eliminate to get to T. So doing modus tollens with line 7 would be good. So can we do 7, 10 modus tollens? 
Not quite. Why not? For modus tollens, we need the negation of the consequent, so we need not not s. So we'll fix that, and we'll say 7, double negation, and then we'll say 10. Oh, no, we won't. We'll say 10, double negation, and then we'll say 7, 10, modus tollens, right, 7, 11, modus tollens, and we have not not t, and we said we wanted that because we can get t from it. And now we can put 9 and 12 together. Whoops, my line numbering is getting tired, 9 and 13. And that is a direct derivation. So, so far we've seen a couple of new, somewhat new things. We've seen that we want to use elimination rules with our new, our new elimination rules. That sometimes... And then we've seen that using introduction rules can be helpful in two different ways. Sometimes, as in 2C, we can use an introduction rule to set up an inference rule application. So in that case, we had uh, if t or r, then s, and we had, I think we had t, yeah, we had t. And so we were able to go from t to t or r, and then to do modus ponens to get s. Here, we use the introduction rule to get what we're trying to show. So introduction rules are quite useful, and you want to think about using them. And then we saw that at least here at this point, making an indirect assumption was not very helpful. And so when you're doing the derivations for the homework, do pay attention to the comments on them in, on the website because they provide some hints about how to proceed, sort of what, what will be useful and what will not be useful. So then in particular, there's a derivation problem whose conclusion is a conjunction. And at this point, there's no reason for you to make an indirect assumption. You're just going to try to show that conjunction in the same way that we did it here by showing first one conjunct and then the other conjunct, getting those on lines, maybe with a show or maybe just inferring them. Either way, getting them and then enjoining them to actually get the conclusion. So there we go. Uh, those are some derivations and some strategy and comments on them. So good luck with your derivations. And uh, I think you'll find them to be uh, maybe a little bit challenging, but not too challenging. And uh, you'll be able to do them. If you have questions, uh, please let me know.